On the weekend of January 4th of 2019, something game-changing happened within the world of DC on film. Aquaman, once a ridiculed character, after less than one month in wide release around the world, overtook Batman v Superman internationally, and thereby at the worldwide box office. In so doing, Aquaman became the biggest and most successful movie in the, for the lack of a better term, DC Extended Universe to date. The producers chiefly responsible for the movie in its current form, John Berg and Jeff Johns, won't get to bask in the glory of that so much though, as they were fired long before Aquaman opened, and their plans for the future direction of DC on film, which Aquaman was the beginning of, went out the door with them. It is their successor, Walter Hamada, that will determine if Aquaman will get a sequel and which direction that will take, as well as the direction of the entire DC on film going forward. In this video, I will go through why Berg and Johns were fired, and which other movies were greenlit on their watch and as part of their direction, before moving on to Walter Hamada, and whether or not he is likely to continue in the same direction for DC on film that Johns and Berg set forth. Over the last few years, Warner's DC division has been something of a revolving door, with numerous both directors and producers coming and going, either in response to movies coming out and bombing, or disagreements on the particular direction of individual movies which may or may not happen in the end anyway. Let's recap how this all begun, and how it culminated with John Berg and Jeff Johns being fired despite having overseen not just the completion of Wonder Woman, which is still the biggest DC Extended Universe movie domestically, but also this incarnation of Aquaman, now the most successful movie in the entire DC Extended Universe worldwide, a movie which they were also the ones to give the final green light. The DC Extended Universe was always meant to be filmmaker-driven, unlike the more producer-driven MCU. That way, each movie would have its own voice and expression, if you will, giving the director full freedom, while each movie still interlocked perfectly with the others. That, at least, was the theory. There was, however, a flaw with that theory, namely that it was bullcrap. In actual reality, the only way movies made by different filmmakers expressing their vision will interlock with each other is if they are producer-driven. At Marvel, producer Kevin Feige, who is himself not the director of any one movie, and therefore can have oversight of the bigger picture, has that role. In the aftermath of Man of Steel and the prelude to Batman v Superman, it was in practice Zack Snyder and his team that became the producers and main architects of all DC movies planned on their watch, most notably Wonder Woman and Aquaman in addition to Justice League, and eventually down the line, The Flash and Cyborg. Snyder and his team cast all of these actors that would be introduced in Batman v Superman, featured in Justice League, and who would then go on to star in their own movies, all of which at the very least had outlines prepped, long before their individual directors came aboard. But then Batman v Superman came out and tanked, and the Warner higher-ups instantly lost faith in Snyder and his vision. That was a problem, because all of the upcoming movies were cast in the same basic directorial mold as Batman v Superman. As such, Warner panicked and reacted. David Ayer's Suicide Squad, which was always its own thing, was mostly done by then and due for release four months later, but it still featured the visual and tonal similarities to Batman v Superman. Therefore, it got last-minute mandatory reshoots and a whole slew of new edits in the editing bay. Wonder Woman would also be modified somewhat with color timing, reshoots and in the editing bay, but that was further down the line, as they had more time with that. And with Aquaman still in early planning, there was plenty of time. The biggest cause for panic, though, was Justice League. The direct follow-up to Batman v Superman, originally written as a two-parter featuring Darkseid, and originally set to feature the same color palette and the same dreary tone as Batman v Superman. Worse yet, it was set to film literally three weeks after the premiere of Batman v Superman. Justice League would have to be restructured, but there was no time as pushing back a massive production like Justice League so soon before it was about to begin production would have been so astronomically expensive, it was not an option. 
nor was firing Snyder, as no better replacement would want to step in to such a production on such short notice. So Snyder stayed on, and the movie would have to be retooled on the fly. Retooled into what? No one could say, just away from Batman v Superman and whatever hadn't worked with that. The filmmakers just had to figure it out as they went along. The higher-ups didn't trust Snyder to do this by himself though, so first Ben Affleck was given the position as executive producer and then later, John Berg and Jeff Johns came aboard. They were announced as the de facto producers of the DC Extended Universe, and they were tasked with charting out a new course for DC on film going forward and for making a new slate of movies. In essence, it was hope that the two could do for DC what Kevin Feige alone does for Marvel. Jeff Johns and John Berg oversaw the completion of the by then in development Wonder Woman. That is Patty Jenkins' movie, but from what I've been told, their notes and suggestions helped overcome the connective issues the movie reportedly had at the time they came in, and thereby may have lent some hand in setting the stage for the movie becoming the success that it did. Jeff Johns had already been involved with Aquaman for a long time when he was promoted alongside John Berg to main producer, and in that capacity, they made further adjustments to the concept and story alongside director James Wan. Also, they reportedly fought for the movie to keep its production schedule, when someone higher up allegedly wanted to push the shoot back till after Justice League had opened, so they could gauge the audience response to the character. This brings us to Justice League, which they were ordered from high above to salvage. Their challenge, of course, was that Justice League was already written, had already started filming, and had already started the process of being changed away from what it was into something, well, no one quite knew what. And on top of that, they weren't given ultimate power. The higher-ups at Warner delivered plenty of notes, often conflicting with each other, so in some sense, Berg and Johns were really two more chefs added to an already overcrowded kitchen. As such, there is a diffusion of responsibility, and no one, certainly on the outside, can say with any certainty who made which call and who is responsible for what. What we do know is that Joss Whedon was brought in to write new scenes and with an eye to take over. Reports that Snyder was the one who requested Whedon's assistance were only put out there to help Snyder save face. Then, tragically, Snyder's daughter committed suicide. This was when Snyder officially stepped back and handed the reins over to Whedon, although there are persistent rumors that Snyder wanted to finish the movie for his late daughter but was pushed aside. Be that as it may, the movie went through another round of major reshoots helmed by Whedon at such an advanced stage in production that the movie really needed to be pushed back. But this is where Warner would not budge. The movie had to be released on November 17th, no matter what. Because of that, they couldn't wait until Henry Cavill had finished shooting his Mission Impossible scenes, so Superman showed up with a mustache on set. Afterwards, there was no time to make his CGI animated mouth look good, like there was no time to give Steppenwolf any expressions to speak of outside of mouth movement, and there certainly was no time to create even the illusion of one cohesive movie. In order to reach the release deadline, corners had to be cut across the board, including corners that most definitely should not have been cut. The movie was released on time, which cost a fortune, and the finished product, or rather the unfinished product, was a Frankensteinian abomination, a mess of a movie cobbled together by footage based on different versions of the same basic script, shot over three different shooting cycles, filmed by two directors, and which ultimately bummed at the box office. It was a good thing that Johnsonberg insisted that Aquaman began shooting when it did, because if they hadn't, Warner might very well have pulled the plug on it. It later transpired, and was widely reported that the reason Warner, i.e. Warner CEO Kevin Sujahara, refused to push the movie back was allegedly so that he himself would still be entitled to a cut of the movie's earnings, even if he was fired by the board, which looked likely there for a while. In the end though, Sujahara wasn't fired. Outside of the DC movies, Warner were doing pretty good on his watch, so he might as well have allowed for Justice League to be pushed back and be completed and he'd still have gotten his bonus. Of course, in retrospect, the cheaper option would have been to just let Zack Snyder make the movie he wanted to in the first place, but hindsight is always 2020. Either way, whenever a movie as big and as important as Justice League fails as badly as Justice League, 
a human sacrifice must be made in the name of corporate politics. Since Sujahara wasn't fired and Snyder was already out, the axe fell down on Berg and Johns. Before they were fired though, Berg and Johns had already overseen the development of and greenlit both Shazam and Wonder Woman 1984 in addition to Aquaman. In some sense, the reign of Berg and Johns was over before it had even begun in earnest. While they contributed to both Wonder Woman and Justice League, Aquaman was the first movie which, while granted had been in development since long before they came to power, was given the final green light to go before cameras by them. Also, while it is director James Wan's movie first and foremost, it is a movie that did in no way, shape or form shy away from what it is, namely an Aquaman movie. It took all the inherent silliness of the character that has been ridiculed for years and embraced it. Not only did we get to see the various kingdoms of Atlantis in all their glory, we got a squid that delivered the beat to a royal fight, and a Lovecraftian monster voiced by Julie Andrews, and an overall more fantastic and quirky tone than we've ever seen before. I'm not saying that Berg and Johns necessarily were the ones that came up with that, but they at the very least allowed it. That is a radical departure from the dark and dreary tone the DC Cinematic Universe movies started out with, and one that seems to have worked. The next movie greenlit by Johnson Burke to hit the screen is Shazam. At the time of making this video, that movie isn't out yet, but the trailers are, and they promise more of the same, light-hearted fun that embraces its core concept. As such, it appears that was the overall direction Johnson Burke wanted to take DC on film in. Alas, by the time Aquaman came out and proved they might have been onto something, they were already gone. No matter what happens to the remaining movies greenlit by them, Shazam and Wonder Woman 1984, it is their successor Walter Hamada that will decide the future of DC film and the next batch of movies to be greenlit. In the aftermath of Johnson Berg being ousted, Walter Hamada was chosen to be their replacement as the new Kevin Feige of DC. However, he is primarily associated with Horror as he oversaw New Line Cinema's Horror division, including the remake of it and the Conjuring series, which incidentally was directed by Aquaman's James Wan. The first movie greenlit by Hamada, the Joker origin movie, which does on the surface suggest a more Horror-like take, and quite possibly, different continuities for DC on film going forward. But just because he is primarily associated with Hoddard does not mean Hoddard is all he can do. According to The Hollywood Reporter, it was his overseeing of Shazam, the movie which Johnson Berggreen lit, that impressed Warner's president and chief content officer, Toby Emmerich, enough that he landed the gig of deciding the direction and slate of DC movies to come. His involvement with Shazam prior to getting his current elevated responsibilities suggests that the more campy tone is something he will have no bigger problem adjusting to than James Wan did when he went from actually directing The Conjuring movies to directing Aquaman. And the success of Aquaman is a very good reason to continue making movies that tonally follow that path. The second movie greenlit by Walter Hamada was Birds of Prey, featuring Margaret Robbie as Harley Quinn again. It is probably not unfair to expect that to be rather comedic in tone as well, and given how Aquaman is doing, I wouldn't be surprised if the third movie greenlit by Hamada will be Aquaman 2. After that though, the future is more unclear. We know that both Matthew Reeves' Batman and Ava DuVernay's New Gods are in development, but no other in-development movie have directors attached, at least not that we know of on the outside. The legacy projects we've been hearing about for years, such as Cyborg and The Flash, and you can probably count another Superman movie among them, are probably, by all accounts, not very high on the list of priorities. I think most or all of them are done, at least for the time being. So what comes next, other than the confirmed Wonder Woman 1984, The Joker and Birds of Prey? Aquaman 2 is pretty close to a given, and Aquaman's success validated the direction taken with that, and with its co-writer and greenlighting producer Jeff Johns reportedly still being involved with writing and with helping Hamada out behind the scenes. I think the more comedic direction is one that is likely to continue in the upcoming slate. They may even have worked on more projects like Aquaman and like Shazam behind closed doors, which will be announced later this year. 
this year is also when we'll learn the fate of Matt Reeves' Batman and if Ben Affleck and Henry Cavill are indeed done as Batman and Superman respectively. In any event, Aquaman will have reinvigorated and altered the future of DC on film in its overall direction. Are you happy about that? And what projects would you like to see get made next? Let me know in the comments. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.